Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Ethical Consumer Podcast. I'm your host, Julia, and joining me today is Jody Hugrich. And Jody wears several hats, one being a registered dietitian and also several job titles of being the local food program manager, community food systems facilitator, and local food leader facilitator. And we'll get into all of those things a little bit later on. But basically, Jody is a wonderful angel of a human being that makes sure that food farmers and people that would like to eat the food are all connected, which there can be kind of some gaps in that system. And we'll get to that later. So welcome, Jody. Thank you for having me. Most definitely. I'm excited to have you. And I see your you and I things and your support farmers in the background here <laughs> on the visual. Waterloo, Eat Local, I think, and you and I local food program. So I could have just read your screen, basically, <laughs> instead of my sheet of paper. <laughs> I love it. Love it. Love it. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for being on today. And this is, listeners, if you remember the Fennegan's Farms episode, this is going to be kind of in a similar vein of a little bit of connecting farmers and their consumers and connecting people to food and also just food access in general. Usually we have some consumer packaged good guests on and I think it's also really nice to focus on our food systems, a little bit of public policy in there thrown into um, and just food in general in a broad scope. It's much more than just a package that we could pick up off the shelves much more than a package we could pick off the shelves so jody what is your favorite food the question i ask everybody yes uh, my favorite food is a sweet potatoes Ooh, versatile so versatile <laughs> now what way do you prefer them or like give me your top three ways because yeah. they are infinite possibilities Yes, um, I love them just sautéed up with garlic, onion, and some local meat. Um, I also like them as um, sweet potato fries, <laughs> and then also mashed sweet potatoes. Delicious. I, you know, I don't think I'd ever tried mashed sweet potatoes until we were in Hungary with a friend of ours, actually, and we had done some roasted vegetables the night before, and there was fennel there might have been asparagus in there there were sweet potato carrots maybe regular potatoes too and zoli our friend and who was hosting us said i think we'll make a mashed vegetables and i said okay like potatoes he's like no no just the vegetables that we had yesterday we'll mash them up and put them in the oven again and i'm like well, that sounds weird but okay best thing ever delicious oh That's my gosh a- you have so many flavors <laughs> and it combines into a brand new flavor i loved it Yes. Loved it, loved it. Now, sweet potatoes, we can get those here in Iowa from some of our local farmers, can't we? That's a yes, pretty good can. Iowa crop. Yes. Yes, yes. Wonderful. More yes, than corn I'm and soybeans. To, yes, I'm trying to grow them myself this year for the first time in a container garden. So Ooh. we'll see how that goes. Small crop, but just testing it out. Sure. Yay. Oh, that'll be so cool. Now, what does your garden look like being a registered dietitian, being conscientious of what you're eating and also conscientious of the environment and where you're getting your things, I assume? Do you have, are we all container garden? Do we have like the beautiful like railroad tie boxes or what are we working with? Yes, um, I actually have a mix of both. I okay. do have actually these um, old aged wine barrels are my containers. So they're just decorative as well as my garden. Fine. I like that the best really because then I remember to walk out, water them. They're right there on my deck. Um, very visible. Um, and those are just, you know, tomatoes and peppers and, you know, sweet peas. I like things that we can easily pick, grab and eat too because I have three kids trying to involve them in the gardening process. Um, but then I do have, I just added one more eight by eight garden. So I have two eight by eight gardens because I wanted to do some larger things. It's still not large enough for my watermelon, but I'm experimenting because we wanted to do a fruit and something different that we hadn't done before. And then we are big potato and sweet potato eaters. So we're also doing a whole eight by eight garden of potatoes this year. So I'm super excited about that. (laughs) Oh, that's so cool. I, so I don't know if I've ever known some someone personally here that has grown their own watermelon do those like vine out like cucumbers do do? 
They do. Yes. And they actually really do take a lot of space. So, you know, you can only really in my space plant about four seeds. So we'll see how it goes. We actually did it last year and mixed it in with some other plants and they did vine out all over the place, you know, and really kind of tangled up with the other plants. So we decided, but we got a couple, we got two, two great watermelons. It was so awesome. So we decided to rededicate a whole garden space this year to see what would happen. So awesome. (laughs) Oh, that'll be cool. That'll be awesome awesome to see the results of that just experimenting i have a tomato pan- plant and a pepper plant that we're hoping to not lose this year we didn't i don't you know my my house plants we've decided i don't have a black thumb for house plants outdoor plants i don't i think i don't know i might leave that up to some other people like our local farmers <laughs> yes 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 definitely we shall see <laughs> So you you live in Cedar Falls. You work in Cedar Falls. How long have you been here? Are you a native or did you move here midlife or so? Yeah, I've only been here for about 15 years. So I am from Iowa originally. I grew up in southwest Iowa in Clarinda. Um, Went to Iowa State, got my RD there, but had to do an internship um, in Dallas, Texas. And then lived in Ohio for a while, lived in Oklahoma for a while, um, but wanted to come back to Iowa. So Cedar Falls um, was what worked best for our family. Awesome. Now, what what made you really want to come back to Iowa? I mean, I think the Midwest is a pretty great place to be in, but after Ohio, Oklahoma too, what made you really settle here? Yeah, uh, definitely family. Um, sure. Both my husband's family and my family, you know, lives here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, interestingly enough, I really like the grocery stores. Yeah. And, um, Iowa a lot better than Oklahoma and Ohio. Um, you know, again, being food as my work, whether it's a dietitian or in my local food work now, mm-hmm. I love grocery shopping, which is actually rare. A lot of people don't. Um, I do. And I just, I missed, you know, what we had here, um, as well as, you know, there was definitely farmer's markets in other parts of the world, but I just missed what we have here. So happy to come back. And again, it worked out job wise too. So it was a, it was a good mix, but yeah. Sure. Yeah. Now, when you moved back to Iowa, were you already a registered dietitian with a with a job elsewhere? Did you have to kind of start over here? How do you how did you end up at you and I with what you're doing now? Yeah. Um, so I have been a registered dietitian for almost 25 years. So um, I was actually staying at home with uh, two of my children at the time. And then my third child was born here in Cedar Falls. And so I was I was a stay at home mom. I had taken a break from the dietitian world. Um, but when the Cedar Valley Blue Zones project came to town, uh, I was ready to get back into um more community uh, nutrition versus I had done some clinical um, nutrition in my past, but really looking at that community nutrition, got involved volunteering with the Blue Zones Project, and then I um, became an employee. I was able to become a part-time employee, which is what I was looking for. And through that, um, I reconnected back with Kamara and Cheyenne, who is the director of the CEEE, our Center for Energy and Environmental Education at UNI. And there was a position open for the UNI Local Food Program Manager. And so it fit very much with that community aspect that I was looking for. So I was excited to take that job. Awesome. And that is the second time that Kamiar, maybe even the third, but second for sure time Kamiar has been mentioned on the podcast. We had Audrey Tranlam, and she is kind of in a different sector of the CEEE, the Center of Ed- oh, no, Education, Environment, and Energy, something of... Close. Environmental Education. Energy and Environmental Education. Energy and Environmental Education. Okay, I had all of the words. I didn't have them in the right order. I tried. <laughs> yes, we had Audrey on kind of in an earlier episode too. I want to say maybe last October or November, probably October. So... Yeah, I like, I, I went to you and I personally, my fiance teaches at you and I, so it's always nice to know that there is a local program associated with our university that's tackling these community, do I want to call them deficiencies, perhaps, just just networking more. I prefer to look at them in a positive light and making the networking instead of focusing on what we don't have that doesn't work. We're just focusing on making things better and work right, better. For sure. So, for sure. Super. Now, what is different as far as being a registered dietitian clinically versus more focused on the community? Is a community registered dietitian 
a thing or an emphasis or is this something that you've taken and kind of molded to be your own? Yes, I would say a little bit of both. Sure. So as, as a clinical dietitian, primarily you're working in a hospital setting. And at that point, um, you're dealing with people that are already sick. You know, you are treating their nutritional needs as, you know, somebody that has either, you know, a long-term condition or a short-term condition. You're also not spending very much time with them. Um, so I was definitely always headed towards the more education route. I was a diabetes educator for a while. So at least I was able to see people in an outpatient setting and really work on life style changes that way. I would say um, there's always been a sector of community nutrition or, you know, dietitians working in that community setting. But it's, you know, again, 25 years ago when I was in school, Iowa State, we did not talk at all like where our food is coming from. So sure. that has shifted in terms of that, that community aspect. You know, in the past, community aspect may have been definitely working in a WIC clinic or, you know, a women infant nutrition clinic. So those things still exist and still great opportunities. Um, but again, working in that community, looking at food in a different way, not only, you know, how you can get the healthy food and eat that healthy food, but also, you know, how is that being produced and how does it affect other areas of our life in terms of our environment and sustainability and those types of things. Awesome. And you said you moved back to Iowa because you really liked the grocery stores, but also the <laughs> farmer's markets. So was there, was there an event? Was there a thing that made you really passionate about local food or have you just always been that way? Yeah, no, I was more self-discovery, I would say, of, you know, uh, reading, just reading some different books, you know, continuing education type things and just learning that, you know, hey, yeah, there's definitely a different, you know, way that all those good foods can be produced. Um, that in terms of, again, having that opportunity to see the farmer's markets here, going there, you know, as that consumer, and then definitely going there as now as a consumer, but also a way for me to also connect with a lot of the producers that I'm working with too. So. Sure. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, let's get into what you do with the local food program. And there, there are a couple different parts of it. And from what I understand, you have a hand in most of the ongoings, but you also, do you work more with one aspect of the food program than the other? Or is it really just you're in charge of it all? <laughs> um, that's a great question. So with the UNI Local Food Program, we do have a lot of different projects that we're working on. Um, many of them are food access based, um, but there are also other programs. Um, right now I'm working on a USDA Farm to School grant with three school districts. So Farm to School I love. I love working with the staff. I love working with students and educating them as early on as we can. So that's really fun for me. Um, also working on another USDA grant with Healthy Harvest of North Iowa and North Iowa Fresh, so two of our partners in Mason City and Clear Lake. And it's a curbside market, so it gives our consumers an opportunity to order local goods online and pick them up at either College Hill Farmers Market, Cedar Falls Farmers Market, or Waterloo Urban Farmers Market. And those two projects are examples of, again, grant funding, which does um, help supplement my position at the university. So we have, you know, the university paying in, we have other partners paying in, and then we're also looking for grant funding on a lot of our projects. Um, another big area I mentioned is the food access area, and we have a very large AmeriCorps VISTA program as part of that food access piece. And we have current, so for us as CEEE, we host AmeriCorps VISTA members at our site where they're doing projects for us and helping us build capacity on a lot of these food access pieces. And then we're also what we call an intermediary, a site, intermediary site where we are actually have other sites across Iowa that hold VISTAs and we're kind of the middleman between um, the top AmeriCorps people, um, our regional people, and then also these other sites kind of filling in the gaps, doing paperwork, those types of things. So so that's a large piece that has actually grown significantly um, at our center. And I am working with the VISTAs on some of their projects and site supervisors, um, but not always directly doing some of those work that work. And sometimes then their site supervisor is Kamiar because really the only local food employees at the center right now are myself and then Kamiar, who is the director, but also does some of the local food work too. Otherwise, the rest of it is partnerships and AmeriCorps VISTA members. So, 
Yeah. It's a broad community and it's all intertwined. So I myself get very confused on occasion because I have several friards in this area like Ar- Audrey, my friend Carmen mm-hmm. works mm-hmm. for AmeriCorps but not Food Corps, but my friend Clarissa works for Food Corps and I'm like, guys, is Food Corps and AmeriCorps this are they the same thing? But then there's the <laughs> UNI local food and then there's the Iowa State Extension and basically it's this gigantic beautiful network of all of the people who care and what to make want to make a difference and they know that they can do so independently with their own organization and their own people but you have also kind of crossed and pooled your resources and your collaboration efforts to be able to do something even bigger mm-hmm. and yes. it's it's beyond just Cedar Falls and Waterloo like you said Mason City Clear Lake the local food program when you're talking about where food is grown and how expansive farms need to be and the fact that they're not even in town mm-hmm. what does local mean for the local food program is it Iowa or is it kind of our little sector here in the middle of it yeah that's a great question um and it really means a little bit of both so We typically um, work in a six county area when it comes to local food or that has really been, you know, what our, our focus has been say the last six years since I've been in this position. But that's in terms of, you know, really connecting say local f- food producers with our local food buyers. Um, you know, we do have some great um, urban farmers and we do have some farmers, you know, in the Waterloo area or outside the Waterloo area. but a lot of our producers are going to be in different counties um because mm-hmm. they're going to be in those rural counties so we're focusing on those six counties you know really makes sense um but we are working on a lot of statewide projects too in a statewide collaborative efforts um and it kind of depends on what that project might be um but just as you talked about you know we're bringing again local organizations together to work together more we're really trying to do that more on a state level too i am part of the steering committee for our iowa region. regional food system working group and basically that is taking you know that regional work on a statewide level and how can we all continue to work together as much as possible um and then branched off from that is different groups um that might be working on more policy and those groups that maybe again can help elevate and change things that could help affect the rest of us on our regional level too. So, it just kind of depends on the project and, you know, what the opportunities are, but I would say, you know, that's probably one um benefit of COVID is, you know, we were doing a lot of Zoom meetings, so we were able to expand that reach too and say, "Hey, well, let's have a meeting, you know, with more statewide partners because we all are doing it and we can do it more accessibly without, you know, taking days and days of travel and those types of things." Yeah, and when you're talking about policy too, I mean that that is very much a statewide situation, so it would be ideal to get as many people involved as possible. as opposed to like if we're just dealing with like you mentioned getting areas around here to be able to have a ordering system to pick up their farmers markets goods from the Cedar Falls farmers market the Waterloo urban farmers market and the College Hill farmers market personally i i think that'd be great because sometimes i can't always get there on thursdays sometimes i'm teaching last thursday i was teaching and i got done at 5:45 and i'm like i'm going to get there before 6 and i didn't so i missed eric and i didn't get to get my eggs sure. but yeah. hopefully i will get the eggs this thursday i feel like this is this episode is a long time coming because originally um eric of yellow table farm said julia you should have jody hugrich on and i'm like i know that name i know i know <laughs> this person so here we are like months later right because eric who was a very popular episode last fall mm-hmm. he is in the cedar valley cedar valley regional Fo- food and farm network Is it a would you call it an association or a group that gets together to yeah. kind of collaborate and network? I say coalition. Coalition. Uh, okay. Yep. I yep. like that word. <laughs> Got you. Well, cool. I'm excited to know that it's bigger than our community, but there are still very community-based organizations too. So, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the regional food and farm network. Is this part of connecting farms to schools? 
It is part of it. Yeah. So basically, you know, with the coalition, we're bringing as many organizations together and um, food and farm businesses. And so those organizations could be schools. They could be, you mentioned Iowa State Extension. Um, we work with Northeast Iowa Food Bank, Blackhawk County Public Health, um, you know, and with that, then Food Corps members and getting all our, you know, AmeriCorps members together. So bringing as many people together that are working on these different issues and then including our food and farm businesses. So it's a way that we can continue to share ideas of how we are connecting people. Um, so definitely schools are a part of that conversation. Amazing. Now for Cedar Falls or Waterloo school districts, they're very large school districts. And I know Eric had mentioned that he, is he in Tripola or Tama schools or both? Tripola. 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 Okay. And that is where the farm is yeah. located. Yeah. Um, so what would it look like Quantity wise, I would assume that is the biggest difficulty to get local food in school systems that are larger. Do Cedar Falls and Waterloo have a chance of getting this local food or is that going to be cost prohibitive or quantity prohibitive? Um, you know, the, you're right. Quantity would be a big concern. Um, however, with a lot of planning and a lot of good discussions, it could happen. And it mm. wouldn't happen for, you know, 90% of their menu items. You know, sure. it would be, you know, if you're not doing zero, you know, right now we would talk about, hey, could we look at even 10% of your items, you know, over the next year? And Many of our farmers and producers are really looking for, you know, a, a steady outlet for their products. So if a large school district like that would say, we are interested in such and such product and even have those conversations, say, in January mm -hmm. and have some good, you know, contracts and some good um, things laid out. Many farmers and producers would say, I would grow that volume for you. Um, so it just takes, com you know, communication. And that's sure. also why we have that coalition, too, is not only is it sparking ideas, but who can we connect with who and who can we start having these conversations with? Because many people want to, you know, whether we're individual consumers or organizations, would like to purchase local they might not know to go how to go about doing it um, and they might not realize that it does sometimes take a few extra steps until you get it down because it's not the normal it's not something that we're used to doing so we just have to figure out what's the best way to do it that it could meet volume and quantity and that we could you know work in one within somebody's budget while still you know providing that farmer with you know a, a livable wage too we definitely will never want to see the farmers and producers short change um, but there's ways to, to work together on that. Got you. So it's not necessarily a situation of the school system going to like the farmer's market or getting hold of the farmer and being like, hey, how many eggs do you have right now? Can we buy your entire lot? It's, hey, in the fall, we'd like to have this partnership. Can you satisfy this quantity? So it's like they're contracting early for a planned amount so the farmer can grow that amount and actually have it because right now if they went to if they went to Eric and was like hey we need lamb he'd be like well they're not ready yet and two sorry vegan friends um I don't have enough for the entire school system so that's not going to work for me lamb is just what popped into my head for that garlic right. even uh, he could probably su supply the school system right. with garlic the right. man grows garlic so yeah so that, yeah. that's interesting to think about that's not something that I would have thought about because that's not something I am associated with it's of course, the school has their entire system planned out, I would assume, and the quantities that they need ahead of time. It's not like they're going to the grocery store like a regular family would. So, Right. And they also yeah. have rules and regulations to follow, too, you know, with that national school lunch program, too. So there's definitely, you know, contracts and bids and things that they have to, you know, document that they're doing also. Sure. Cool. How many, about how many farmers and farms are associated in that program? Because you drive through like Highway 20, and you see so many farms, and a lot of them are very mass quantity farms that are shipping elsewhere. But yeah. we have so many local small farms. How many do you work with on average with that coalition? 
Yeah, you know, with the coalition, that really, like, ebbs and flows, and it depends on, you know, if you're talking how many meetings has somebody come to, or how many, like, you know, conversations and partnerships might occur, you know, in other situations. Um, but we have a directory that we put out um, every year, and we just switched. It used to be always a buy fresh, buy local using that branding. Um, this year, we've transitioned to new a new brand, which is Grow, Eat, Play, mm-hmm. and with that, we we have about 40, 40-ish um, local producers that are on that list. Um, but interestingly enough, even in my job of knowing a lot of producers, I would say that, you know, every season I hear about at least two or three more that I didn't even know about. So yeah. I'm just excited that there continues to be those local small producers that, you know, are finding their niche and maybe, you know, haven't found us yet as a coalition. Sure. And again, so it's so exciting that that number, you know, continues to go up every year. Definitely. That's one of the parts that I know we'll talk about later for sure. And part of the reason I wanted so badly to have you on for the longest time was People don't always know what programs are in their area, especially if if you have not, if if it's um, like a food pantry situation or the food rescue that goes on after some of the farmer's markets. If you have not been in need, you will not have sought that out. You will not have needed to seek that out and you're not going to know that it exists. And, you know, I don't necessarily work directly with farms for anything other than this now. Um, it's somewhat indirectly still. But um, I did attend that Food and Farm Network meeting yeah. when you released yeah. the, uh, the the play aspect, yeah. which I oh. love. And I know my friend Clarissa is all about working with kids with Food Corps. So that was yeah. exciting. But um, it, getting getting the awareness out there has to be one of the hardest parts. I mean, I think it takes people, it took people long enough to catch on to the idea of farmers markets here because we didn't really, we didn't have them when I was growing up. I know. Do you, do you know when this, when the first farmers market started in the area? Like as it, as as it is known now? Um, you know, I believe that this, if I, I'm guessing a little bit, that the Cedar Falls Farmers Market, I would say, has probably been, go- been going on for at least 15 years. Um, and for College Hill Farmers Market, I always consider that a new market. That's mm-hmm. the one I'm in charge of. But it's been going on for eight years. I okay. just added that up the other day. So, um, but yeah, I would say at least 15 years, if not even closer to that 20 mark on okay. some of those other markets. I would, from my, I remember when the Cedar Falls Market became a thing. But I don't really remember that it wasn't a thing before. It's like I feel like it's always existed, and I'm 31, so that would be about right. That it's always been my awareness when I considered buying my own food. I don't think I considered buying my own food when I was 10. But I went with my mom, and I picked out some jalapeno cheddar bread. And yeah, uh, I remember that. I think that is so awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it's nice. And now I live so close, I can walk on Saturday mornings. <laughs> it's a lot of well, cool. Let's talk about with with the Food and Farm Network. So you're you're networking for farmers and the schools and making sure that everyone has the resources that they could possibly want. What are some additional things like you mentioned there's the resource list, there's a directory that you're doing for farmers. I want to say in that meeting was on there was a gentleman on from the USDA that was that was was it I don't think it was grants, but I think, I think it was a grant to get, maybe it was even USDA organic or something like that. Help with that. Mm -hmm. Do you recall? Yeah. Yeah. Really education is a big thing for the farmers and producers. So, you know, yes, there is, you know, when new programs are coming out, um, I'm reaching out to those producers, letting them know about certain things. You know, we've even um, hosted and had our own education programs where we've, um, you know, brought together certain topics and speakers and those types of things. Um, one of the big things that we do, well, actually a few big things that we do every year is our networking event. So we always have a local food producer and a local food buyer networking event where we try to get um, 
in a non-COVID year. We try to get as many people together, um, both producers and buyers, put them in the same room and essentially do like a speed dating style where they have, you know, everybody has such limited time. So you have as many producers and buyers as you can, but you only have, you know, like an hour and a half and you want everybody to talk to each other. So we basically have, you know, the producers move around the room like every five minutes. So they had that opportunity to have at least one contact with somebody who may want to buy their produce and then from there then they do their own follow-up on their own time and develop cool. those relationships that way but we really want to be kind of like that starter if they don't know some of these buyers um we also do a local food dinner every year and people are always surprised by this but we have this local food dinner in february because it's another opportunity that we can con connect probably more consumers just mm -hmm. individual consumers to our producers so our producers Producers, you know, some of them will be able to attend in February when they're not busy growing their own food in our wonderful growing season. So we work really hard to procure a lot of local food and store it or process it as needed and then have it in this February dinner so we can bring together and have a nice dinner with our producers who produce this food. And again, you know, just we hear from them, we do a producer panel, ask them questions, and everybody again has this opportunity to listen to them, but also an opportunity to, again to talk to them one-on-one -on -one. so if you haven't been to a farmer's market to talk to a farmer or producer this could be another opportunity to do that and we also do the same thing with our local food and film festival in March too so the morning time on that day is dedicated to again kind of like an indoor farmer's market you know maybe during the summer months you're not able to go to a farmer's market and meet some of these producers you can still come meet them on this Saturday in March and learn about the ways you can get their products elsewhere besides the farmer's market too. So, you know, we do a lot of, again, that big coalition is probably really focusing a lot on that institutional level, like a school or a grocery store or a restaurant, but we want to provide these other opportunities where, you know, you or me, any or any individual consumer has more opportunities to meet these producers who are growing their great food in our area. Sure. Honestly, it was really fun to just jump on that Zoom call, not being a farmer, not really being someone who works with like food or policy or connecting people in this area but it was just interesting to see the interaction and the networking that could happen I guess for me being an outsider when I think of a farmer I think of them just handling their stuff handling their crop or handling their livestock and I mean I've, I've come to know now that you know there's just little pockets of friends and folks that are willing to help you out like putting up high tunnels and things like that i saw several friends over at eric's doing that and then several later yeah. over at tomorrow's acres with jeff and molly um sure. it's it, there you would think it could be a very lonely thing and it ends up not you know people are there to lend a helping hand physically when needed and then also programs like yours help them connect and get their produce or their livestock in other areas other than just the farmer's market, which in Iowa can be a little difficult because we don't have fantastic weather all year round. Right. So they usually usually go on a pause. But um, I think that was the Waverly Farmer's Market. They continued to have something over the winter last year, didn't they? They did. They did. Yes. And they always have a winter market. Okay. Um, but this year with COVID, they did pivot to where you could order online and just pick up versus actually coming to the church to see the vendors. Sure. So. Got you. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Well, and you know, surprisingly, you're right. We cannot gather as much in say December and January outside at a farmer's market but that is one of the things that we hope to expand a little bit too is to help those producers find different outlets for their products because there still is a lot of great products still in December January and February sure. um, if they're stored right those root crops and even apples can be great sources mm -hmm. of local products but it's harder to get those in the hands of consumers without having some of those face-to-face -face markets. Yes, definitely. Especially if, if, I mean, I would go if there was just like a single, a single table pickup, but it would yeah. be easier to get people out in droves if they knew they could do like maybe even like an eighth of their grocery shopping in one small right. area, rather than pick up one or two items on their mm -hmm. list. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Well, I'm excited to see where that goes and how these kind of online and uh, order to pick up farmer's market style events keep 
going because I mean like both of us kind of said earlier it's like the Cedar Falls farmers market has been going on for 15 to 20 years that's really not a long time in the grand scheme of things so I think yeah it was it was a uh, nice during it wasn't nice at all during the pandemic but it was nice that we had to figure out different ways of doing things and I think those some of those will last like yeah, the winter pickup sure. so yep yep Definitely. Awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about where I'm going to call it food access, even though that is not specifically one of the programs that you work with directly, though our friend Emily does. Um, yes. Food access in any area can be, I would assume, kind of daunting to take on because it is a little bit more than just networking and bringing people together. It's also networking with uh, taking in financial situation or kitchen situation, electricity situa uh, situation into consideration. Um, that was a lot of Asians. That got, <laughs> that got, a, little, got, got a little messy. Uh, but there, there are so many things to consider when we're talking about that. And the Greens to Go program, did that get to happen this year? I don't remember. It or, did. Well, yay, it's, wonderful. Yes. Would you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Because that is not something I knew existed, again, because I never needed to seek that service out until a few months ago when I was talking with friends. Yes, yes. So, yes, our, the Greens to Go, it's a mobile produce stand, and it was started um, – actually probably six years ago with a UNI student. So it started as a UNI student class project and it is in basic terms exactly what it sounds like. It is a produce stand with local produce and it is mobile. So it goes into neighborhoods in Waterloo um, where you would have a place that we would consider would be a food desert, which basically means, you know, there is not a grocery store within a certain mile radius. Mm -hmm. um, and then it has transitioned over the few, the last few years um, in terms of then it became an AmeriCorps Vista pro program. So which meant it was, up, again, it stayed with you and I, and it just meant that we had, you know, AmeriCorps Vista members who were, looking at how, you know, how do we make this bigger and how do we make this most effective? Um, and so over the last five or six years, you know, it may have been on different days and different locations, just kind of trying to find out what that niche is, but it's really serving people that don't have access to that grocery store. It was a produce stand in terms of it was going into certain neighborhoods. And so it was a little different than a farmer's market, because if I'm going to a farmer's market, you know, those farmers are looking at, you know, uh, they're wanting to earn money mm -hmm. to again, have that livable wage. With our Greens to Go program, we were using either volunteer labor or our AmeriCorps Vista labor or a lot of volunteer and then hiring some UNI students too. So we had people that would go to these farms that would do the labor in terms of um, harvesting those crops. And so therefore we had these great relationships with these farms that they were willing to sell that to us you know, at a good cost because they weren't doing the labor. Yes, they grew it, um, but they did not have to go out and spend the many hours harvesting it. Sure. Therefore, the Greens to Go mobile produce stand could turn around and sell that at a, at a cheaper rate than, again, what you might find at a farmer's market because, again, it was targeting areas, you know, that needed that fresh produce. And, again, we were providing that labor piece. Mm -hmm. So it's it's been that connection of kind of behind the scenes, you know, providing – this resource for this mobile stand to go into different neighborhoods. Um, but exciting this year is it still exists, but Greens to Go is actually going to be um, underneath the umbrella of We Arose. Another oh, yes. person that you should interview in the future is Daquan Campbell. <laughs> and Daquan, he's on my list. Actually, <laughs> I so that was that was a note that I made from the Food and Farm Network. I'm like, I don't know what this We Arose co-op is, but I absolutely love what it sounds like. Yes. Yeah. Tell me a little yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so Jaquan Campbell was a UNI student, and he also worked for the UNI Local Food Program. So we do hire students, um, and for the exact reason of getting more people knowledge about the food system and how can we plug them into some different work. So Jaquan did some great work for us, and then he decided after he graduated that he would become an AmeriCorps Vista member. So he did another year with the UNI Local Food Program. 
as a Vista member working on Greens to Go. <laughs> and in the meantime, he was he has had this vision of developing um, this co-op. So it's going to it's We Arose Co-op. And basically he is um, doing outreach and education as well as working with a group of farmers as well as having an urban farm himself that is really like this teaching area um all of that under the umbrella of we arose so greens to go still exists but we are transitioning it from a uni local food program to a we arose program and that will be the way that he gets out into the waterloo community where he grew up um and he wants to you know give back to that community and we'll do the education outreach as well as have that produce for sale in those neighborhoods and working again with very many of the farmers that we were working with in the beginning of the program but he's also expanded that reach to some other farmers that can be part of that network too so it really is an exciting project in terms of greens to go itself and what has been able to do the last six years but then also what you know we arose is able to do too and also take some of those efforts and make them even bigger um they also have a home delivery program that they're working on again and um and and reaching it reaching some of those neighborhoods that don't have that access to those fresh fruits and vegetables sure and uh, you mentioned this term earlier but food desert if some people are not familiar with that term because maybe they don't live in one and they don't realize that it's difficult to get to a grocery store but i do see that see that being a very big problem in waterloo and that was mentioned very heavily with the Fennegan's Farm episode as well, which they, I believe, are on a very similar, if not identical, very similar mission to Daquan in the sense that they were not able to get culturally relevant food close by Mm -hmm. at an affordable price. They'd have to go to Trader Joe's and then they'd have to go to Whole Foods and then they'd have to go to, I don't know what their grocery store is. They don't have Hy-Vee in Detroit. But, um, (laughs) you know, they're their local chain grocery store some places you just you cannot get to all of them in the time span you would need to to successfully do your groceries or make a meal not even considering transportation if you do not have a car if you have a metro transportation system like cedar falls and waterloo that is used and exists but only runs every hour it's impossible to get to every place you might need to go or even just be able to. I think the last bus route ends at like 630. What if you work until 530? What if you work second shift? I mean, like, it's very yeah. difficult to actually consider doing that. I've always had a car. A lot of people do not have cars mm-hmm. and it's not their choice to not have a car. So having the delivery and having the the truck or the van to go through these neighborhoods that might be farther away that as they are farther away are probably going to be a lower income demographic and probably not going to be able to get to a store that could be a 20 minute drive or a three hour trip by bus in total. Mm -hmm. So yes. mm, Yes. mm, mm, mm. My goodness. This is uh, obviously this has come up a couple times in the past season, but this is something that I was unaware of now I'm very aware of and I can't always do things but I can I can make other people's voices louder and help them do their thing so sure yeah oh my goodness I will I would definitely be talking to Daquan I did see that I think on perhaps it was even the Cedar Valley Food Co-op or Rooted Carrot Co-op's um Instagram I don't remember but yes yeah that'll be such a such a great program and even more even more of a broad reach for the food program at you and i too oh so cool so cool so where do you where do you hope to see all of these programs go in the future obviously bigger better broader but do you do you have any perhaps personal goals or where where do you see this how do you see this transforming in the next five to ten years Yeah, you know, um, I think for me, always uh, sustainability is a good word. Um, We, you know, a lot of, we do have really a lot of great programs going on. um, And the hope would be that, you know, in five years, that, you know, in 10 years too, that these programs still exist and that, you know, maybe they're done you know, more efficiently that they're able to reach, you know, a wider group of people. Mm -hmm. Or again, like we've talked about, we can't necessarily do everything on our own, which is why we've transitioned that uh, Greens to Go 
to we arose so the hope is that you know we can sustain what we have going on or we can continue to find good partners that are able to carry out some of this work and then maybe we have that opportunity then to start some different um, programs and be again that launch pad for a few things that we can find then other organizations that are, are ready to to take that on and you know keep it going Sure. Wonderful. I like I like the idea of being that launch pad, kind of like the microphone or the, the megaphone, mm-hmm. getting getting those who are passionate about all of these very specific things, a launch, a start mm-hmm. and a voice. Yeah. Like you mentioned with the co-op, he was we arose, not the not the rooted carrot, but uh, with we arose, he, he was working for food access. And now now there's a whole new tangent that gets to go mm-hmm. serve more people. So cool. Yes, One definitely. thing that I forgot to mention in our in our last little bit here was um, the SNAP availability at mm-hmm. the Waterloo Urban Farmers Market. Now, that is not available, to my knowledge, at the College Hill Farmers Market or the Cedar Falls Farmers Market. And whereas one may expect, if you understand the divide between Cedar Falls and Waterloo and also the demographics that each have, Perhaps, perhaps you could consider that we're, there would not be as much of a need in Cedar Falls farmers markets just because of where they're located. But why is that? Why why has Cedar Falls and College Hill? Maybe that's a hard question, and maybe it, maybe it's just that the need was not expressed. But why why is not every farmers market accepting the snap for the double? Bucks. I know Des Moines does too, I think. And then one in Minneapolis does as well that I'm aware of, which made me very happy. But I'm assuming that's kind of a new service that's starting to come into play. And that probably has some politics and policy. And of course, with the state of Iowa, WIC and SNAP being um, state, is it state or nationally funded or a program? It is um, probably a little bit of both. A little bit of both, but... <laughs> Do, and that might not be something that you work with directly, but are you familiar with that? And do you have any insight as to if hopefully that will continue to catch on or? Sure. Hmm. Yeah. Hard Actually, question. Actually, so, yeah, very, very good question. Yeah. So with your, um, you know, SNAP EBT benefits, um, you know, you have to, of course, for somebody using that, you qualify through the state. So that it's a statewide in terms of qualification um but you can go so there, there's two parts to a little bit to your question is you can at any farmer's market in the cedar valley there will be individual vendors that will accept snap ebt so um you will find those you know some markets might have two vendors some markets might have five vendors or more you know and you'll notice that because they'll have a sign that says that they can accept you know snap ebt Um, However, what you're referring to then is there is the um, Healthy Estate Initiative um, Double Up Food Box Program. So the Healthy Estate Initiative um, works on the funding piece for this statewide program of Double Up Food Box. And with Double Up Food Box, if I am a, you know, SNAP EBT holder, I can go to the Waterloo Urban Farmers Market and I could go to a centralized EBT um, machine, I usually at the welcome tent, and I could say I want to spend $10 in fruits and vegetables at, basically I want to spend $10 in fruits and vegetables. They will give me tokens for those $10 that they've just swiped my EBT card for. Then they will also give me cards um, that will add up to $10. So basically, uh, by going to that centralized terminal, I have just gotten an extra free $10 to use on fruits and vegetables. And so that's what the Double Up Food Box program is. And you can also do that at, um, hopefully at Greens to Go, I know they're working on that. You can also do that at Hoffman's Produce, so Mm -hmm. another... um, Waterloo grower um, outside of Waterloo, but they actually have people that come out to their place and pick up vegetables and get vegetables. And they also accept Double Up Food Bucks too. With Double Up Food Bucks, you can also earn them at the fairways in both Cedar Falls and Waterloo. And so I could go use my EBT card there again, earn my Double Up Food Bucks, but I could save those Double Up Food Bucks and spend them at the farmer's market. So you can spend those Double Up Food Bucks at any 
qualifying or participating store or vendor or market. Um, now, with that, I will say that, you know, again, you you said it correctly that, you know, there has been a bigger need um, in the past for the Waterloo Urban Farmers Market. And um, I'm actually on the Waterloo Urban Farmers Market Board. Um, mm -hmm. So I have a little insight on that in terms of, you know, that has just been their mission and their goals. Um, but to be able to run that program, you have to have um, a market manager and a good set of volunteers too, because you have to have somebody staffing that machine. Sure. Not to mention there's the behind the scenes of getting, you have to have a federal number from the government and you have to have your EBT machine and equipment. And again, then you have to have somebody who's able to staff that at the market. So. I am hopeful because I am the market manager for College Hill Farmers Market, um, <laughs> and I have you know a great student assistant and have one every year that helps. So we have the staff and the capability to do it. Um, we ran into a few snags on our federal government application, so therefore College Hill Farmers Market has started. But we're hoping that by July first, if not shortly after, that we will be able to offer the Double Up Food Books program for awesome. participants again. again Again, to just offer people, we know that there are people in Cedar Falls that would benefit from that. We actually know there's several students um, at the university that would also benefit from that too. So we're hopeful because it is an excellent, excellent program. It just takes a few little logistical things that we're working through. So sure, and that thank you so much. You explained and divided my accidental double <laughs> question so well because it. <laughs> It, it, it is kind of complicated sometimes. And as you've just explained too, I, I wanted to be very kind and actually, Cedar Falls, what's the deal, guys? Come on. Cedar Falls people need this too. I understand maybe, you know. Uh, all, all aside from that, it's, it's a difficult question to ask, but also a complicated answer because it's not that the desire's not there, I would hope, but like, I would never have guessed. Of course, if you're going through the state, you have to have something there. There has to, the connection has to be made somewhere between the state program, the amount of money is how to spend the monies and it, it just can't be easy now, can it? But, it, but yes, there we go. That, that is such yeah. a wonderful thing to know and such a hopeful thing. And I, I appreciate the Waterloo Urban Farmers Market even more because that is clearly something that they had to jump through hoops for mm -hmm. and they did it. And they have yeah. done it successfully. And now that's going to be hopefully the blueprint for mm -hmm. others in the area. And I just got goosebumps because now that because there's this whole food network in our kind of northeast Iowa, centralized Iowa location, you know, you're on the College Hill board. So you did that with Waterloo. You understand that. So now College Hill will be that much easier and you have help to do that. No, you don't have to reinvent the wheel and figure it all out on your own. You got friends and you got people <laughs> to help do it with you. So that's, that's the biggest thing. It all comes down to community effort and cooperation to get stuff done because yeah, of course, once one person's done it, it's a lot easier to replicate it. So yes, oh, definitely, definitely. That makes me happy. Yeah. Cool. Oh, thank you for answering that. And so well, so well at the same time, too. Now, we have so you, you, your paws are in everything, Jody. It's impossible to not ask you all of the wonderful questions because you know so much about what's going on in the area. Um, we also have the Rooted Carrot Co op eventually coming to uh, Main Street in Cedar Falls, which is very exciting. And I remember when that started about eight or nine years ago, I think. This has been a long time coming. There's finally a site. There's finally a building. Now, we have the farmer's markets, and we have the networking that you assist with, with farmers and restaurants and schools and programs like that. But co-ops are also a big way that farmers are able to profit off of their hard work. Now, Definitely. are you, is the, I'm assuming that the food network at you and I, or the local food is able to partner with Rooted Carrot to make sure all of that happens. So really the groundwork has kind of been done. Once the building is there, once the system is up, all of these farmers within this area have one more brick and mortar place that's open longer than four hours on a Saturday morning, which will be excellent. 
Is this yes. the first co-op that you have assisted in getting off the ground? Or did you have a part of, in Ohio or Oklahoma or Texas? Did you Have you ever done anything like this before? No, I have not. <laughs> Yeah, so it is super exciting. And so, yes, I'm actually uh, the board president of the board of directors for the Rooted Carrot. Um, <laughs> and it's so interesting because both of my, you know, that's my volunteer life because that is purely volunteer. So my volunteer and my work life, you know, are, are coinciding like all the time. Um, so it's been super exciting. Um, I've never been involved in opening a co-op before. Um, and it is exciting. It's it's, it's great. Um, it's like opening a new business. So it's, you know, really trying to find the skills of all the right people as volunteers to bring together to make this awesome business happen. But I am really excited for all of our producers for everything that you just said. You know, I mentioned early on that there's a lot of great local products. Um, you, you know, our produce can last until February. You sure. know, our farmers and producers are storing it correctly and they can continue to sell it. Um we also have a lot of great year long products, you know, yeah, honey can last year long. We have, you know, dairy products, we have our local meat, we have all these things that again are, are able to be sold all year long, but not always the access to do it. You know, many of our farmers and producers and a lot due to COVID, you know, may have their own online website and maybe their own online delivery, um, but this will just make their customer reach so much broader and it will be that consistent, you know, sales um, on a weekly, monthly basis that they know that there is this brick and mortar place to, you know, take their products to. Um, you know, and we have a lot of interested vendors, you know, even though the building, you know, and the store isn't open, we're just keeping that list of vendors of those that are interested. Then once we're able to hire that general manager, then there will be contracts, you know, and it really will be that business and that partnership. And here's a contract and here's the things that we need from you. And it will be great from those lo for those local producers and farmers. Definitely. I'm excited. I think I became a member two or three years ago. I have, it was before it was rooted carrot. So I, I have my, my Cedar Valley food co-op. It's going to mm -hmm. be worth money someday. I'm sure That's I have my right. original member joining bag. So uh, yeah, I am super excited to see that, um, going toward downtown and it's just off the highway, thankfully. Um, so just, just a little hop from downtown Waterloo as well. So yeah, Definitely. It'll be wonderful. Wonderful. Well, do you, so you have, I mean, like you said, your, your volunteer life and your job life. And obviously f folks that are listening, I don't expect you to remember every single program name that we mentioned, because clearly I also have a difficulty and I feel like I have a friend or an acquaintance or two in every little pocket of what we've discussed today. But how do you balance all of these things what is your motivation because th really there's a lot going on jody how do you how do you do it and you have you said you have three kids i have three kids yes yeah, yeah. what yes. is what keeps you grounded what is your motivation and how do you just handle it all with such grace thank you um you know i do think that um it's just so important. It really is, you know, so important for our community to be able to, again, have that access in whatever capacity to buy from our local producers and our local farmers and um, interacting with those local producers and local farmers like you have found, you know, with meeting Eric uh, is probably what keeps me going because, you know, at the end of the day, they are such great people who um, just need the resource that we're able to offer them. You know, their their job is growing their food and they do a great job of, you know, doing that um, and growing food for us too, that we just want to help, you know, get that food out into the community, get it into hands of mm -hmm. as many people as we can. So I think that's the motivating factor is just to continue to educate people, you know, that that food is there. It's great. It's so much more nutritious. It tastes so much better. Mm -hmm. um, and the support that it gives again, like, these businesses and these people that turn around and spend money in our community is just, it's just a win-win for all of us. Um, you know, and it's very easy. I would say for myself too, you know, yes, would it be easier to go get every single item I needed, you know, at the grocery store and then not make an extra stop? It definitely would, but 
is it as good and tasty and nutritious and as fun, you know, as it is to be able to talk to those producers at a farmer's market or where else I might, you know, be buying from them? Mm -hmm. No. So it's definitely worth that. Um, And I would always encourage people to think about that too, is like, it's definitely worth it to buy from those local producers. And that's motivates me and job and volunteer life to be able to continue to bring those opportunities to all of us as consumers. Awesome. And from an environmentally friendly standpoint, it's a lot nicer mm-hmm. when your produce is just coming from 20 to 30 miles away and not sure. Mexico or Canada. <laughs> definitely. definitely. Oh, so wonderful. Awesome. Now, do you have any advice for like a person like myself maybe eight months ago that didn't know that these programs existed and wanted to get involved what 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 advice do you have for someone who might be interested in starting or helping or finding local food access and coalitions outside of Iowa even in in their neighborhood where where might they find that information Yeah, definitely. You know, um, I would say locally, um, we'll start there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, if you happen to be a social media person, I would say following Cedar Valley Regional Food and Farm Network on both Facebook and Instagram. Also looking at our website, which is cvfoodfarmnetwork.org. Um, same thing with rooted carrots. We are you know, not only talking about what's happening with the rooted carrot, but we're also talking about what's happening in the community and a lot with local and mm-hmm. local producers, too. So both Facebook and Instagram for rooted carrot. Um, and just really doing a Google search, I think, you know, you can find many of these coalitions across the state of Iowa. I know that for sure. And again, just working on, you know, a national level in terms of, you know, learning in um, webinars or conferences and things like that. You know, there's the National Farm to School Network. Um, so there's always going to be like, I think, food things on local, state and national level Mm -hmm. so it just might take you know a little bit of searching searching up local food searching up you know local producers and i think that you should be able to find something you know in terms of an organization or even maybe it's just a few couple people you know in your community starting to work on things that you can start to build you know your own coalition or network with you know individuals or groups too Mm -hmm. i never thought i enjoyed networking because it seemed like a weird um, it just, it just seemed like a weird thing to me. I think I'm, I'm pretty good at meeting new people, but it was, it also just seemed like when you were going out to make connections and network and things like, it seemed like this slimy business thing that I didn't want anything to do with, but it, I mean, it can be, but it's, it's not at the same time. It doesn't have to be. And I, I think back to like first having Eric on and finding you and then talking to my friends that are involved with these programs already and then finding so many things that I had no idea existed even in the past few months. It wasn't that hard. I just tried. And you do one Google search and then you get a hyperlink and then you click that and then you get another link. So I I mean, I think you said that perfectly. Local, super local, statewide, nationwide, like just takes a tiny bit of effort. But yeah, Yeah. thank you for that. And then for any registered dietitians who are thinking, okay, I've done the clinical thing. I'm kind of curious about community. Mm -hmm. Forgive me for not knowing because I feel like the Blue Zones community really took off and was a really, really hot thing for a second. Mm -hmm. Does that still exist? Are we, it's, or has it morphed into something a little different by now? Yeah, I would say the concept still exists, still in some different like committee work. Like there's still like the complete streets committee that is still meeting to really look at, you know, how do you make, um, I believe more more so in Waterloo maybe, but but how do you make Waterloo, Cedar Falls, you know, walkable communities? So there's Mm -hmm. still a lot of behind the scenes things that have existed where you might not see it as, you know, flashy, I guess you could say, (laughs) like it was when it first came to town. Um, And then also some of the initiatives also have transitioned under Healthy Hometown. Mm -hmm. So if you would search in Iowa, Healthy Hometown, that is um, sponsored by Wellmark, who was the big sponsor for the Cedar Valley, or the Blue Zones project across the state of Iowa too. So it's there, it's just there in a different way that people don't always realize. Awesome. I definitely didn't. So where you you had Blue Zones, someone else 
else may be able to get into contact and kind of shift their career focus if they wanted to with Healthy Hometown. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Super. And then do you have any recommendations, book recommendations, quotes, things at all that you'd like to leave our listeners with? I feel like we've talked about so much and we've just barely scratched the surface, but I feel like this has been a wonderful overview of the possibilities and what just exists. That's step number one. Any advice? Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Um, Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, I'm thinking right now what's popping in my mind um, is like hashtags, hashtags of all the things that we, you know, we've been putting on social media, you know, and what just keeps coming to mind is, you know, like, support local, know your farmer, you know, know your producer. Um, Yeah, I mean, I I couldn't like, you know, say that to any better is just, you know, keep those in mind all the time. Like, how can I support local? How can I get to know my farmer? Um, Those would be like the biggest advice and things that pop in my head. I have um, a whole stack full of books that I need to read. There's a lot (laughs) of great things out there. As I look but at my very be, full bookshelf to my right yeah. here, I don't know what you're talking yeah, about. That might be one of the areas that I um, <laughs> lack a little bit is the reading. <laughs> and I do have to say, yeah, uh, you know how Eric, you know, talked about me um, needing you, know, you needing to meet me. He said the same thing about me needing to meet you. So Aww. I have to say, I have really enjoyed um, your podcasts that I have listened to, and I am much probably more a better listener and multitasker um, than I am sitting down and reading reading a book therefore that might be how I get some extra things done sometimes so (laughs) well I am just honored and and likewise also I love reading I love reading so much life has things that need to get done and it's very nice to be able to take in information and points of inspiration while you're folding the laundry it makes the laundry much nicer I think I fold the laundry slower but um I like to think that I still I still get two things done at the same time Hopefully, yeah. but yeah. Well, wonderful. This this has just been so great, Jody. Thank you so much. Again, listeners, this has been Jody Hurich, registered dietitian and all of the hats, all of the titles, but mostly the local food program manager. Um, based at UNI, based in Cedar Falls, Waterloo, Iowa, um, handling connections and between farmers, consumers, and local areas like schools and grocery stores, food co ops, restaurants even. So I'm looking forward to see what all happens with We Arose and hopefully some more EBT benefits being offered at local farmers markets, maybe winterized farmers markets and things like that. So it'll be great. Thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Most definitely, guys. We will see you next time. This has been the Ethical Consumer Podcast. I'll see you later.